Good afternoon. Welcome to our afternoon colloquium. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Laura Waller. Uh, she received her degrees in uh, electrical and computer science, all bachelor's, master's, and PhD from MIT in 2004, 2005, and 2010, respectively. And thereafter, she uh, worked at Princeton as a lecturer in physics and also as a postdoctoral till 2012. And since then, she has been at UC Berkeley as uh, Ted Van, Der, Van Duzer, endowed assistant professor um, since. And her general area of research interest is in the area of computational imaging, I guess even more broadly imaging and sensing. And today she's going to be talking about computational imaging and gigapixel microscopy. Thanks. Uh, really awesome to be here in a college of optics. I'm so used to being in schools of computing. Uh, and what we do is basically, the moral of the story is optics plus computers is better than optics or computers. Um, so I love to be with people who actually know the optics already. Um, so we're, what we're working on is computational imaging. This is a pretty popular field right now. And it's just this combination of joint design of your optical system and your post-processing algorithms or possibly even online algorithms for processing. So as like the canonical example, you can think of it that your computer becomes a part of your imaging system and that we want to find a design for our imaging system that leverages the fact that uh, I have all these algorithms available to me and so I may not need to design my optics to take a picture of exactly what I want as my end result, but rather to take a picture of some intermediate thing that gets at my final result in a better way than I could otherwise. So the whole pipeline from uh, system design to the final result that you would like to reconstruct should be designed all together. So here's like a toy example. You take your camera and you change its optical design. This example is the light field camera, and I'm, this is a lenslet array that I'm shoving into the camera somewhere. So physically change your optical system. This is hardware plus software changes. Take a picture, it looks like garbage, but it contains different information than a normal image. So you send it to some nerds to process it, and they give you back this picture. This is from a Lytro camera. Uh, so this is a scroll in front of a tree. OK, who cares? This is just a normal picture. It's kind of cool that I can take something like that and reconstruct this. Actually, these don't go together even. This is just a piece of it. But uh, this picture is digitally refocusable. So it's a light field reconstruction, uh, and that allows you to focus at any depth after the fact. And this is what the, the light field camera does. Um, so you can't do this in a normal camera, right? So the hardware modification enabled this, but the algorithms allowed you to get at this from whatever data you took. Okay, so I work near Silicon Valley, so step five is start a company. Uh, Lytra is my colleague, Ren Eng's company. Pelican Imaging just got a lot of money from Qualcomm. I don't know if it's going to happen, but camera arrays on your cell phone are coming. Um, so uh, another example of something that we do in the lab, this is pretty recent. Uh, so we're doing light field imaging, but we don't have, we can't afford to make these fancy lens lit arrays. Um, and actually, for some reasons, it might be better to just use like whatever you have. So we just take a diffuser. This is a piece of privacy window, uh, glass window, like the, the sticker you put on your window so the light comes in, but you can't see through it because it's all scattered. Um, so we take a picture. It looks like a bunch of caustics. We very carefully design the distances so that um, so that both wave optics and ray optics apply, so that we can run some inverse problem to solve for the light field. Um, so you take a picture that looks like this. It's just a picture of these two cards through this diffuser. Um, but because we kind of have pre-characterized the diffuser, we know it well, we can do an inverse problem and so do this kind of digital refocusing. It, it's the same idea as the light field camera, but now you have a multiplexed measurement because you measured, uh, you measured stuff through this diffuser where the light's all, all passing through different parts. So I'm not going to talk about the details of this. And there's still lots of quality work to do on this because you have a fundamental issue of number of measurements you're taking. But this is just an example. And this is also photography, right? So my group almost exclusively works in microscopy. And the reason for that is because we know wave optics. And all of our computational imaging stuff is uh, in this realm of wave optics. So with photography, everything is big re with regards to the wavelength. And so you don't care about wave optics in general. You can just treat light like a ray. Everything's linear in intensity. And that's beautiful and easy and nice. And you should do that if you can do that. Use the, the, the minimum abstraction that you need to. 
But we work in microscopy where things are closer to the size of the, the wavelength of the light you're using. And so diffraction, interference, and general wave optics effects become quite prominent and they can't be ignored anymore. Um, so this is where we're going at is to try to do the sort of like similar things that are in computational photography, but applied to microscopy where uh, we have to do the wave optics version of them. And everything becomes more complicated because this is a more sophisticated model. We have to talk about uh, phase and amplitude, but we never get to measure phase. We only, ha we only get to measure intensity, right? So almost everything we do involves some sort of uh, phase retrieval somehow embedded into the algorithm. Uh, and everybody pro here probably knows about phase imaging. It's this idea that light is a wave. It has an amplitude and a phase, but we always measure intensity, which is amplitude squared. And so we never get directly at the phase. So phase imaging is, it, uh, actually phase imaging is impossible because you can never exactly measure the phase of a light wave. It's traveling far too fast on far too small of a time scale. There's no sensor that can do this. But what we can measure are something like this, which is, the 2D map of the relative phase delays across this sample. This is a cancer cell in a microscope. And this is why it's important in biological microscopy is because if you don't stain or tag your sample, then it's completely transparent and you just don't see it. Um, so Zernike won a Nobel Prize for doing phase contrast. What we're doing is quantitative phase. So this map is intended to be a one-to-one -one direct mapping of uh, an exact map of how much phase delay is caused by different parts of the sample. It's different than phase contrast. Phase contrast is a nonlinear mapping. You can't one-to-one -one go back. You can't separate, if you have a dark spot, you can't separate it from absorption effects from phase effects. Here we're separating absorption and phase effects. So it's quantitative in that sense. Okay, there's a lot of applications for this. This is just a few that we do in my lab. Um, we do a lot of biological work in, bio, in biomicroscopes. Um, these are cheek cells and epithelial cells. You can do surface profiling because if you have transparent uh, things like this, this is a microlens array, then you can do metrology of it because the phase delay is proportional to the shape. Um, we work a lot with the ALS, which is the Advanced Light Source at Berkeley, and they do, uh, it's a lot of EV lithography work. That's allegedly what's coming next in lithography is we have to go to shorter wavelengths to EUV, um, and being able to measure phase just allows them to see different things on their masks and wafers. You can pick up defects much more easily because they're phase defects if they're little indents and stuff. Uh, and we allegedly have a project to do uh, X phase in X-ray security screening. Um, that should be starting soon. Um, so, okay, so I wanna go through this pipeline of computational imaging, but phase retrieval must be computational imaging. We cannot measure it directly. So, uh, I want to talk, it's a nonlinear problem because of the measurement. So you have some complex field X. Let's just assume this X is some 2D map of the phase and amplitude uh, that I would like to measure. So this complex field represents the sample's absorption as the amplitude and the sample's phase delay as the phase. And it's going through some optical system represented by some operator A uh, and I measure intensity at the detector. Um, so this optical system is linear in complex field, right? We know this. So uh, we can design almost any A that we like, but some A's are more practical than others. So uh, there's a system design piece here, and we do a lot of system design for particular applications. How can we make this optical system simple and cheap and easy to build in such a way that that A matrix is still a good measurement matrix? Um, so the inverse problem is easier to write, harder to solve. It's just find X given these measurements of intensity after your complex field went through some linear system, right? Um, and, and this is, there's a lot of different algorithms for this. I'll talk more about them later. Um, but they have their relative trade-offs because this is a nonlinear, non-convex problem with millions of pixels because we're trying to solve across a very large image. So computation becomes important. So because this is computational imaging, the very key piece of this is that these things should talk to each other. There should be an iterative design process in which you think about what algorithm you're going to use and how it fits in with your system design, how you can modify the system design to be simpler or to make your algorithm easier. Will it allow you to block up your algorithm into parallel chunks that run on GPUs where instead of trying to solve uh, you know, a nonlinear inverse problem of size a terabyte or something like that? Uh, so. Uh, we do, a lot of this is rather uh, uh, sort of black magic or art. And I just want to talk about one particular uh, physical system that we use that's a really nice hardware platform. 
<laughs> but I want to get at this gigapixel imaging. And that's the idea that we're trying to do very large scale imaging. So we would like to measure phase and amplitude, but across a very large scale. I want a large field of view and high resolution. And I want to do it all in a commercial microscope that's simple and cheap. Um, so your typical sensor, we have a, one of these SCMOS sensors. They're pretty expensive, but they're pretty common in biological uh, bright field microscope labs. So uh, you can get towards about a gigapixel per second. It's a data streaming rate. That's your final limit. But then uh, how do you design your optics so that you have like richness in your data, so that you're not just taking a fast video of a 2D image? Um, so this LED array microscope is what we're going to use for this. Uh, we copied this design from a group at Caltech, Cheng Hui Yang's group. Uh, it is just like a really cool microscope platform. You take a normal microscope, you simply replace the illumination unit with this LED array. This thing is literally a toy. You buy it from Adafruit, this is an Arduino company. Um, and it's just like one of these signs that you put like in your office or something. Cause, like if you're a big nerd and you want to like have some uh, sign flashing in your office. So it's programmable three color array. We actually build our own arrays now because these ones don't allow you to turn on multiple LEDs at once. Um, and then a microcontroller. We started with Arduino. We've moved up to some fancier ones. But the idea is that we're just going to control the illumination above the sample. So it's simply placed above the sample, no optics in between. And then the microscope images it as it normally would. Um, so the idea is that the LED, or this is the LED array. There's a few LEDs on here. And each LED is illuminating the sample from a different angle. So I, I have this array here, and my sample's down here. If I light up the center LED, I, it's a spherical wave, but I've placed it far enough away that it's effectively a plane wave at the size scale of the sample that I care about. So it's spatially coherent at the sample. So this is a coherent system. Um, and so I'm illuminating from an on-axis plane wave here. If I turn on this LED, I'm illuminating from an off-axis plane wave. So all I'm doing is patterning the angles of illumination. The illumination will still always stay sort of uh, homogeneous across the entire sample. Uh, we're going to take uh, data. This is the data that we take. So we flash LEDs in this particular pattern. Looks like a disco party. And we're going to do all kinds of things with this. Um, so uh, the original reason why this was uh, built was this gigapixel phase imaging, and we've taken it to a few new uh, new areas. And I'll just start with the simplest one to explain: is this multi uh, multimodal imaging. So think about your your LED array is just a source; it's just the source of your microscope. So if I just turn on a bunch of LEDs, then I light up the sample. This is a normal microscope image; it's incoherent illumination. It's a bright field image. We call it. It's just a regular image, right? So what if I light up all of the LEDs outside this particular ring? I can get a dark field picture. Well, what's this particular ring? It represents the range of angles that pass through the microscope. That's set by the NA of the microscope. So if you have a particular numerical aperture, it will define a particular uh, ring, a, a particular circle on your LED array, which is in Fourier space of the sample. It's effectively far field. Um, so you're basically pattern, you're illuminating from angles that are too high to pass through the microscope. So the, you get a dark image except for all of the light that's scattered into the, into the NA of the, your microscope. So this is what dark field is. We know this. Um, w what we added to this was phase contrast. And we did this by lighting up half of that first circle and then the other half. Um, so we can get this phase contrast picture. So this is not so obvious. So I'll explain it. Um, so this is called differential phase contrast. This is the illumination-based version. Colin Shepard taught me about this uh, method a long time ago. Um, and we're doing it on this LED array with illumination-based version of it. So we light up half of the LEDs in this circle. So we're illuminating from one side only, right? OK, so imagine my sample now. Uh, maybe I'll just show this. So if I illuminate from the other side, both of these are phase contrast. This is a microlens array. But clearly, this is not quantitative phase. This does not map to the shape of the, the microlens array. Um, so if I add these two images together, since all of the LEDs are incoherent with each other, the sum of these two images should add up to just the bright field image. That's just your normal image. No phase contrast, right? Uh, an in-focus imaging system with symmetric illumination has no phase contrast. So you don't get any phase contrast. This is just some absorption contrast because stuff is scattering outside of the microscope. However, if I, do, if I subtract those two images and then divide by the average, this is what I'm calling my DPC or differential phase contrast image, I very clearly get some phase contrast. And if anyone's done DIC, this looks a lot like it. This is close to the first derivative of the phase. 
it's related to the gradient of the phase, not exactly um, along this particular direction. And the way you can think of this intuitively, everybody's taking Fourier optics, is that uh, if I illuminate from one angle, I'm essentially illuminating with a phase ramp, right? So what does that do in Fourier space? That shifts my spectrum, right? If I take my spectrum, so I take my spectrum, this is my pupil function, I take my spectrum and I shift it in this direction, and then I illuminate from the other side and I shift the spectrum in this direction, but my pupil clips the edges, right? So effectively, when I take the image collected from this side minus the image from this side, what am I doing? I'm comparing the left and right side of my spectrum. If my object was purely real, it would have no phase information, and I would expect Fourier space to be purely symmetric, and any absorption information will be purely symmetric in Fourier space. So by doing this subtraction, I've completely removed all absorption effects. So this is only phase contrast. If there was like a black dot on there, it wouldn't show up here. Um, and now to get to say that it's the gradient of the phase is much more complicated, you can read the papers. Um, so it's not actually the gradient, it's something like this. So this is the transfer function from phase, the spatial frequencies of the phase information in the sample to the spatial frequencies of the intensity measurements in this DPC image. This is a little weird, right? It's a transfer function from phase to intensity. This is a nonlinear effect so that this is, you can't write a transfer function, but we're doing it anyways. And we do this by linearizing with Born's approximation, which is fairly accurate in this case. So, and it's not exactly a gradient. A gradient would be a perfect ramp, but actually it dies off at the edges because of the MTF of the system. It's incoherent illumination, so we get out to twice the NA of the imaging system. So we get twice the spatial resolution in our phase retrieved as we would have if we used a coherent phase retrieval method. Um, and then we simply deconvolve this out because we've linearized the problem into a transfer function. So we take our DPC image and deconvolve it. In practice, we actually, if we want to do good quantitative phase imaging, we would do le top minus bottom and left minus right together because you have this line of, of uh, zeros in your transfer function which ruins everything along one particular direction if you don't. So uh, one thing that we can do with this is, is like, this is actually really interesting because bright field, dark field, and phase contrast are th the three most popular non-fluorescent, non-tagged uh, imaging modalities in a microscope. And typically you have to like physically remove elements of your microscope and put other ones in to switch between one or the other. But now we can simply time switch these three different patterns on our LED array and get like simultaneous videos from all three. They're just time interleaved in this way. So this is nice if you just want to see these different contrast modes all at once uh, for various biological applications. Um, these are C. elegans babies. Uh, here's another example where we're just doing quantitative phase here because these are pretty pure phase samples. They're unstained um, uh, epithelial cells in a microscope. And you can see here that because we get this twice the resolution, we can actually get to like, pretty uh, high resolution information very, very fast because in this case, we're using four images to reconstruct every quantitative phase image. So we get about, we run our camera at 40 hertz and we get a 10 hertz phase reconstruction. It's just a Fourier transform, so you can run this on a GPU in real time and actually see the result in real time. But this was really nice for me because we started to actually see some of these subcellular processes that are happening very, very fast that we weren't seeing in some of the previous methods we used that were too slow. Um, they were just getting blurred out, basically. Here's another example of just some phase dynamics that you're getting in these cells over time. Okay, so I think the coolest thing that you can do with this LED array microscope, which, so everything here is the same hardware platform, different, different coding strategies on your illumination and different um, reconstruction algorithms. But I think the coolest one is this gigapixel phase imaging. Uh, and this gets at some of the really uh, interesting algorithms work that we've been thinking about lately. Uh, but the idea is to, this was the original idea of building the LED array microscope, was that you can get both high resolution and um, large field of view. So you always have to choose, right? Camera, microscope, whatever. Your optics has a finite space bandwidth product and you're going to have to choose either I zoom in and get a good resolution over a small area or I zoom out and get a bad resolution over a large area. And we want to get both. Um, so uh, there's a lot of reasons why you want to get both. Pathology is a huge motivating example, but live cell imaging is huge. All, the, all these quantitative biologists who are trying to do cell studies on tens of thousands of cells, but they can only see two or three in their field of view at once when they're trying to look at subcellular uh, stuff, then it gets like very cumbersome. So this is, a, this is not a full gigapixel. This is one of our first images, um, but it's, it's getting towards a gigapixel image. And we have this 
few millimeters field of view, but we're getting 0.7 NA, which normally comes with a very small uh, field of view. These are red blood cells, and this is, uh, malaria is a great example. So malaria diagnosis is still done with optical uh, microscopy, and what they need to do is look for infected cells, so they need to look inside these five uh, micron or so cells, so they need very high NA. 0.7 is actually quite low for malaria diagnosis, and they need to do it across tens of thousands of cells, and ideally as quickly as possible. So you could do this, right? You could use a high-resolution microscope and just physically move. This is, what, uh, this is what the Zeiss scanners do. They cost a half a million dollars, and they simply physically move this thing within, uh, ac across the, a larger field of view with a high-resolution microscope. Major problems with that, right? So one, mechanical motion, it's slow. It's never going to work on live samples. Um, two, probably more important, your sample's never flat, and it has uh, really big problems with uh, having to keep things within the, the depth of field. So you have a really small depth of field, and so you have to do autofocusing at every step. That really slows things down quite a lot. I'll show you we don't have to do that because we have a naturally larger depth of field, for better or worse. Um, uh, and then they don't get phase, right? So we're getting phase information here. Okay, so how do we do this? This is called Fourier tachography in general. I don't really like the name. Um, but the fundamental idea is synthetic aperture plus phase retrieval. So synthetic aperture is to uh, capture information from different angles or Fourier space. Um, so spatial frequencies, this is the spatial frequencies of the sample. So if I want a high resolution image, I need to fill in a large part, a chunk of, a large bandwidth in this Fourier space. Spatial frequencies are exactly equivalent to angle in this case because we're assuming monochromatic um, coherent stuff, even though it's LEDs. Um, and so the idea is that I need to build up this larger Fourier space, but uh, I'm going to start with a low NA objective. So um, why do I do that? I do that because my optics needs to trade NA for field of view. And so if I don't get stuff into the field of view, I have no hope to resolve it ever, right? Uh, to reconstruct it ever unless I physically move stuff. So the idea is to start with the big field of view and build back the resolution by filling in more of this Fourier space. So we start with a, uh, low resolu a, a low magnification microscope objective. These also happen to be a lot cheaper than the high resolution ones. Um, they have less aberrations problems because they're at very low NA. And, but they, they give a terrible image because nothing is resolved, right? So this is to scale these, uh, these NAs that I'm listing here. And of course, NA scales with spatial frequency. They're not one to one. OK, so I take a picture. Low resolution, because it has this finite bandwidth because of the pupil function, which is limiting it in the NA. But actually, uh, if I illuminate from different angles, what am I doing? I'm shifting the spectrum in Fourier space, but it still goes through the same pupil, right? So if I illuminate with an off-axis LED, essentially what I capture is this part of the Fourier transform of the object. So it's same bandwidth. This is still a low resolution image, but it contains information about the high spatial frequency spatial frequencies of the sample. So that's what dark field images are, right? They light up areas where things are smaller than the diffraction limited resolution of the microscope. Uh, because they're the light that scattered further than the NA would allow, and so they go into the system when they should have gone out, right? So dark field images do contain sub-resolution information if you think about them in terms of this. And so then you can imagine what we would want to do here now. We're just going to turn on one LED at a time and fill in this gigantic Fourier space and then take the inverse Fourier transform. Uh, I wish it was this easy. Uh, but so fundamentally, we're, we're covering this larger bandwidth in Fourier space, right? And the NA that we can get to is the sum of the NA set by the microscope objective, which is really small intentionally because we want large field of view and the NA of the illumination, which we've designed to be very large. So these LED arrays are actually pretty big. They come out to very high angles. We're currently building a dome that covers the full 180 degrees. Um, so you simply get to add the two, and that's going to be your final resolution limit if you can stitch them together correctly. So that's the hard part. Uh, I would like to then just take, turn on one LED at a time as I sweep through all of the LEDs, and each one fills a circle in Fourier space, and so by turning on all of them, eventually I can fill in the whole circle. Um, but th there's a caveat, right? Because I can't simply turn on all these LEDs and take a picture and expect it to have a higher resolution or somebody would have done that a long time ago, right? <laughs> What's the caveat? Well, if I want to fill in this synthetic aperture Fourier space, 
and I just want to take the inverse Fourier transform to get the high resolution image, I better know phase, right? Because if I do a Fourier transform of something without knowing the phase, it's going to just look like garbage, right? So I need to have phase and amplitude in Fourier space in order to reconstruct the image with higher resolution. So that's where the, the phase retrieval part comes in, is that we need to not only stitch the images in Fourier space, but also solve for the phase. And the phase comes from the overlap between these circles. You can see that at every point in the Fourier space, it will get, it, it will get measured by more than one image. So every circle corresponds to one image captured with a particular LED in the array on. And every position in Fourier space should get captured by at least three different images so that we can do phase retrieval. And this DPC idea of, of shifting uh, uh, my pupil function and comparing the two, that's where the phase contrast comes from. You already saw I just shifted my illumination off axis, so any asymmetric illumination will create phase contrast. It comes from a particular part of Fourier space, um, so we can't analytically write how to solve this for phase, but we can set this up as an optimization, a nonlinear optimization problem, and try to solve the whole thing. So nonlinear optimization problem, we're going to write a cost function and try to minimize it, that, and the cost function has to describe the measurements I took, uh, I want to minimize the difference between the measurements I took and the measurements I would have gotten if my current estimate of the object was correct. So this is my object, the O, and it's in Fourier space. We're doing everything in the frequency domain. So this object is shifted according to which LED I turned on to get this picture, and then it's chopped by P, which is the pupil function. Actually, we have aberration, so the pupil function is not just this binary circle, but it actually has a phase. It's complex. It has a phase to it as well. Um, we did everything in Fourier space, but we measured in real space, so we take an inverse Fourier transform, and then the intensity was the absolute value, right? So this is the model, our physical model for the measurements. Um, and then our inverse problem is just solve for O, right? So uh, we just set up, this is my forward model, and this is my measurement. So let's try to minimize, in the, in the uh, mean squared sense, the difference between the measurements I took and the measurements I would have gotten given my current estimate passing through the forward model. And we'll have to figure out a way to update the estimate as we go. Um, so it's a little, we do stuff a little bit more complicated. Tychography has a long history of all these ideas. They're all stolen from, from what I call regular tychography. This is Fourier tychography. Um, and the idea is that you can also solve for the pupil function because we don't know the aberrations. And so, and since this is, this is always getting, you're always multiplying by the same thing in Fourier space. So it's always being convolved by the same thing in real space. And you can, this is like a blind deconvolution problem, but actually we have a, a lot of measurements. So you can solve this blind deconvolution problem. Um, but we jointly solved the, for the two of them using an alternating projections type approach. Um, so we solve for both the object and the aberrations, which is actually really important because we have aberrations and they, they will ruin the result if you don't solve for them correctly. Okay, so here's a result. This is a large field of view image. And if I zoom in, uh, I would have this low resolution images. So this is the actual raw data I take. And this is taking different subsets of LEDs turned on. So I'm taking a bunch of images, synthesize them all together. This is just one patch of this larger image. We actually solve for the whole thing. And then we get the high resolution one. And the beauty is that if you look at the data, it's all local, right? So I don't need to solve this problem on the whole image at once. I can actually choose these patches to be appropriate to what my computer can handle. We typically do a couple hundred pixels square. Um, actually, that also sets your, how far away you can put your LEDs because you need to keep the coherent, you need to keep spatial coherence across this patch, not across the whole image. Um, and we solve for the aberrations, of course. So here's what the aberrations look like on this patch. When we move to the other patch and solve it separately and in parallel, uh, it will have different aberrations, so we can remove spatially variant aberrations in this way as well. So we do one other trick, is that uh, we think we know what angle we're coming in at with our LEDs, but we don't because there's lots of problems. And so we also have like an optimization procedure that loops around looking for where the LEDs are using simulated annealing. So I call this algorithmic self-calibration, and this is absolutely key to getting nice pictures from this. Otherwise, you can spend two days aligning this and get one nice picture at the center of the image, but you'll never get a beautiful, consistent result with multiple samples unless you're doing sort of some of this uh, post-processing on in order to do the calibration. And I think this is a really powerful idea to be doing this kind of um, do your calibration Take some extra like engineered redundancy data. So we have a lot of redundancy in our data. And use that to solve for 
uh, par parametric like problems in your in your system, and we know where the problems come from because we built the system. Here's just so we have a whole collection on Gigapan where you can play around with these and zoom in. This is dog stomach cartilage tissue. You can zoom in and see subcellular features across a wide area. Okay, so I want to talk about the, the algorithm. I say like we're going to solve this minimization, but how the how do you do this? Um, so we start. It, it's a basic nonlinear optimization. Start with an initial guess. Uh, impose your intensity constraint. So every measurement we took is a constraint on the algorithm. Uh, in Fourier space, where it came from in the Fourier space, this pupil function support should be a constraint. Uh, and this is evolving too because we're trying to learn the pupil space as well. And then updating the object estimate and the aberrations. Uh, this is the key piece. Let's ignore it for now. But uh, <laughs> we're going to update the object and then run through this iteratively, right? Okay, and as I add more and more images, you can imagine I get better and better resolution because I'm building a larger and larger bandwidth in Fourier space. Okay, how do we do the update? Um, uh, so this is basic optimization theory. Take your old estimate uh, and then add some correction factor to it, right? What are these correction factors? Well, uh, this alpha is just some step size. We use a line search method to search for what it should be. That's pretty standard. Search direction is extremely important. So. The, you want to search in the direction of gradient descent. So you want to take your cost function, take its derivative, and then you're trying to set that to zero, right? So you want to go in the direction uh, that's going to improve your estimate, right? Um, this is a non-convex optimization, but we're using convex opti optimization methods on it, and it seems to work. Uh, nobody knows why. Um, there are some reasons why. But uh, I want to make a plug for second order optimization, particularly for non-convex problems. Uh, we've found that fundamentally second order optimization is better. And what is second order optimization? It's the idea that I don't want to, I, I want to go in the direction of, of, the, of the steepest descent, right? This is what gradient descent is. However, uh, if we know how curve, if we use the second derivative, we can talk about curvature of the, of the cost function. And so by knowing the curvature, we can actually go more smartly along this correct descent direction and go in the right, uh, the right distance along it, right? And so uh, everybody knows that uh, second order optimization like Newton's method should get you to the correct answer faster. So if you have a complex problem, it, you, you, always get, you always get to the correct answer, but you'll get there faster with second order methods. I want to show you that we actually get to a better answer with second order methods. That I don't know how to explain, but it's because of the non-convexity. Um, we don't actually use a proper second order Newton's method because computing the second order derivative is possible. We've done it analytically, but um, computing the Hessian at every step, which is just the, the matrix second order derivative, is just a, a massive computational problem. It's not really feasible. So we do these sort of um, tricks. LBFGS just tries to sort of finite difference, estimate the second order derivative based on the previous first order derivatives. Gauss-Newton is better than L LBFGS, and it uh, looks at the diagonal of the Hessian, and ours is a little bit modified even from that. But that's usually enough to get you going in the right direction um, with really minimal computation. Okay, so here's a, this is just a particular, I'm not even showing you what the thing looked like, but this is a great, uh, this is like what we always see. If you look at how the number of iterations for these different algorithms, so the, the top three are different versions of gradient descent, different step sizes, um, different ways of, of doing it. LBFGS is always better. It's this quasi second order method using the first derivatives, but it's not really getting at the second derivative properly. Gauss-Newton is really getting at the second derivative properly, so it converges much, much faster, right? Um, so the top one is the actual phase error as you go through these different iterations. And the, uh, the bottom one is the cost function. And I wanted to point out here that if you look at the cost function, for, a lot of, for all, the, all of the algorithms except Gauss-Newton, they look like they're descending pretty quickly where they're not actually reducing the error that quickly. So they're giving some sort of false hope, I think. Um, and this is my commentary on fast versus exact. <laughs> So second order is the exact way to do it, but it's slower, right? Because I have to compute this second derivative at every step. And so uh, I'm only showing you the iterations here, but actually in, our, in practice, our, uh, our second order methods are doing so much better with every iteration that we can use so many fewer iterations that our runtime actually drops by uh, more than half. It's less than half of the 
even of the LBFGS. And gradient descent is, never gets there. You can run for 10,000 iterations, and you're still not at the same sorts of error values you get in second-order methods. So here's um, some results for this Fourier tachography. Um, this is the gradient descent result. This is, in particular, a, b a bad situation. We've picked a part of the images that doesn't work very well. Um, gradient descent is gertrude saxon if you've ever done gertrude saxon phase retrieval. gertrude saxon is a type of gradient descent with a particular step size. So our gradient descent is actually smarter than gertrude saxon because it chooses the, uh, the line search optimal uh, step size. So the second order methods just do better. And they're more, they're more robust to noise and error, um, which is not that explainable. OK. So, uh, we got really excited last year, two years ago. This postdoc from Stanford came to Berkeley who had worked on this algorithm called phase lift, which is like a applied maths theory, theoretical way to take this non-convex problem, lift it into a higher dimensional space in which it is convex, and then solve the convex problem. And then you have a provably guaranteed convergence on this phase retrieval problem. Super exciting, right? Like we've never been able to prove that this is, this is the correct answer and we'll always get the correct answer. So we were really excited about this and then we tried it. And what do we get? A whole bunch of garbage. <laughs> so phase lift is the algorithm I'm talking about. There's a little bit of a caveat because, um, because lifting it into this higher dimensional space goes from n squared pixel, n, n pixels to n squared pixels. When we're talking about a million pixels. That's going to a terabyte of data. And you have to run SVDs on a terabyte matrix. Like, just not going to happen. So what do you do? You use a convex relaxation, which makes it less provable, but um, but possible to run it. So this is the not provable version of phase lift, actually. But still, this is supposed to be fundamentally a better algorithm, and it's not working very well. And if, if I showed you simulations, you would see that it is better in simulations. Um, but it's not better in practice. And this was super confusing for me. So um, we're taking our flow is the follow-on to phase lift. It's, uh, it's just like computationally uh, more easier to run. It ends up being very, very similar to, um, to some of the second order methods, actually. But uh, what, what we found, this took a very long time to figure out, but what we, we realized is that uh, this, the gradient descent and Gauss-Newton methods that we were using were minimizing the difference between the measured amplitude and the, measured, and the expected as estimated amplitude from our, our current estimate of the object. Whereas phase lift and Wurtinger flow were minimizing the differences in intensity. So this is a cost function. You're just running an optimization on it. So there's no reason. They're both going in the same direction. There's no reason why that they shouldn't be equivalent, right? Any guesses to why they aren't equivalent? <laughs> it's not obvious. Let me prove that this was indeed the problem. So we wrote a, a proper maximum likelihood is the proper way to do this. Um, and we wrote a maximum likelihood solver. It's really slow, so we don't use it much in practice. Um, but it's the right way to do this. And if you use the exact same algorithm, but with these two different cost functions, you see exactly the artifacts that, we were, that were troubling us, right? So clearly, it's because of the cost function that we're getting these artifacts. Um, I'll just say quickly that uh, we actually use this one in red, the sequential Gauss-Newton method in practice, because it's extremely computationally efficient. It's fast. It doesn't require a lot of memory. And it seems to get as good a result as this maximum likelihood method, which is actually should be better. Um, OK, so why do we get these weird artifacts based on the cost function? It shouldn't happen if we had uh, Gaussian noise. But we don't have Gaussian noise. We have Poisson noise. And if you remember, I took a bunch of images with the LEDs that are within this bright field circle, right? So all of the center LEDs create bright field images. They look like this. They're very bright. And then as soon as I took pictures with LEDs that were outside the NA of the microscope, I have dark field images that are very dark, right? And so uh, because we have Poisson noise, what happens is the bright field images have more photons, so they also have more noise. And the dark field images have uh, pr noise proportional to the intensity. And these are wildly varying intensity values, orders of magnitude different, right? So the fact that the noise is Poisson is the problem. Because if you use an intensity-based um, cost function, you're effectively assuming Gaussian noise. And if you use an amplitude-based cost function, you're not assuming Poisson noise, but you're assuming something closer to Poisson noise. So our maximum likelihood did assume Poisson noise. But this wasn't enough to explain 
the large different, the, the severe artifacts that we were getting. Because we have an SCMOS camera, very good noise performance. It shouldn't have been enough to cause the large artifacts that we saw. And in fact, that wasn't what was happening. But what was happening was that aberrations behave the same way. Um, so the, the, the errors in our measurements due to aberrations can be quantified in simulation. And they are also proportional to the intensity of the image. Um, as are these, these are the, the key errors, systematic errors in our system. LED miscalibration, so I think my LED is here, but it's actually over here. That causes errors in your measurements that are also proportional to the intensity. So they are systematic errors, but they seem to have a Gaussian-ish profile. I mean, we kind of did simulations to cause this. But um, they're behaving like Poisson noise. So a Poisson noise assumption is a much better assumption for this kind of thing. So our point is that basically, um, the cost function assumption was causing us to uh, sort of uh, be more robust to both noise and systematic errors, like model mismatch errors like this, which I found really interesting. The other key piece that we looked at is initialization. Uh, if you're in a non-convex problem, starting close to the correct answer is very important. There's a lot of theory on this, but actually physically-based initializations have been much more powerful for us. Um, and so. We use DPC, so we just add up all of the images from one, the left half and the right half and then subtract them, solve for quantitative phase. It's this born linearization, but it's only the initial guess. But it's a good initial guess because it's a fairly accurate approximation. Without it, we very often just kind of fail in our phase retrieval. But with it, we get much better results. And you can see here the problem is we lost all the low frequencies. So the low spatial frequencies of phase are very hard to recover with this system. And, uh, the DPC initialization gets those all put back in the right place so that your algorithm doesn't have to work as hard. OK, so we wanted to do all of this on live samples. We can put an incubator in there, but it was fundamentally just way too slow. Scanning through each LED was just really painfully slow. Um, so we, we made our own custom arrays that are brighter. Um, we made a real-time hardware sync, and we're going to do some multiplexing that I'll talk about. But here's the first result with uh, in vitro. This is uh, live cancer cells in a petri dish. They're dividing. And this is, um, these are just some, looking at some of the fields of view. So if you watch that one, that cell's going to divide into a couple. Um, this is bio 101. It makes some actin filaments, curls up in a ball, and then explodes into a bunch of cells. And this is a quantitative phase map. Uh, we're taking the data pretty slow here still, every eight seconds, but we started out with 10 minutes, so this was an accomplishment at the time. I'm going to get to half a second later. Um, yeah, and this is a quantitative phase with unstained samples. Once you get good quality phase results, you can start doing quantitative uh, analysis on this. So Cell Profile is a very popular software package for biologists to do segmentation and tracking like this. Um, you can compute things from it. But um, getting to this point was actually quite difficult. You need very high quality phase maps to be able to use Cell Profiler. They actually have a whole page on their website about how it doesn't work on phase images. But it does if you have good phase images. Um, OK, so that, the, the next thing that we really went after was time. And the big problem with time was that we were collecting all these redundant images. So this overlap was resulting in us collecting, actually, the original case is that you, you need 60% overlap between the, each neighboring circle. And this is pretty fundamental to tychography. There's a lot of papers on this. You can't beat this. The algorithm won't converge if you don't do it. So what you end up with is 10 times more data collected than reconstructed. And that just seems wasteful to me. And uh, we shouldn't have to do this, right? So you can't get away with just downsampling or, uh, or spreading these out. It just won't work. Um, so what can you do? And uh, the way we went after this was with a multiplexing approach. Um, and so that idea is to say, OK, before I was sequentially scanning one LED across one to the next, um, so this is like an A matrix that's just a diagonal matrix, directly, directly doing what I want. Multiplexing is the idea, turn on a couple LEDs at once, and if you make these all linearly independent, then you can make some A matrix that's, that can be invertible, and then you can solve this whole thing. But you're turning on more than one LED at a time. That's great, because now I can reduce my exposure times. Um, and ideally, I would like to just throw away some of the data and solve this problem anyways, right? Uh, so that would be compressed sensing, and I would have had to take the measurements correctly. Our problem is a little bit harder because it's, a non it's absolute value squared. So designing these multiplex codes is very not obvious. Um, we don't have an ideal way to do it, but uh, we, do it, we do this fairly heuristically. But our, our coding strategy is this. 
we say that if I light up the, the bottom half, top half, left, right, sorry, left, right images, so I, then I'm doing my DPC, top, bottom, left, right, DPC. That's four images and it covers everything out to twice the bandwidth of the, twice the NA of the microscope. That's pretty good value, right? Before I was taking like uh, 40 images to cover that space. Um, okay, so now I covered twice the bandwidth. I'm going to still run my nonlinear optimizer even though um, the, it was a linearization that got me there. And then outside in the dark field, we can't use DPC, so we do random coding. So we choose eight LEDs randomly from the remaining ones, eight from the remaining of those, eight from the remaining of those till they're all full. And then we can do it again if we want to take more images. Here's the disco party that it creates. Um, you can see the center ones in the middle doing the top, bottom, left, right. Um, and so, okay, so that's great. So I choose eight because I had 10x redundancy um, and I'm, so allegedly I could have chosen 10 and used only a tenth of the data, maybe, uh, if it's going to be a solvable problem. But I use 8 because I'm engineering in some extra redundancy because this algorithm is not perfect. Um, so uh, here's our, our old result. So low resolution image, scan individually through each LED. There's about 300 of them. It used to take us 10 minutes, make some hardware improvements. We got down to 7 seconds. Um, but then use this multiplexing strategy, and we not only get to reduce the exposure time for each image, but we're also just going to use less images. So we simply throw away um, seven-eighths of the data because we've covered all of Fourier space after uh, one-eighth of the, of the full data set. Um, so this only takes a, qu uh, a half a second, and you can get towards a gigapixel image with this, which is pretty well matched to biological samples because live biological samples, like cells like this, typically you need to capture it within a half a second or so, or they're going to move and motion blur out all the stuff that you're trying to recover, all that high resolution stuff. This isn't compressed sensing because we're not making any priors on our sample. We're simply throwing away some of our multiplex data. And so it's very much not provable that we can actually get the right answer, but it works very well. Um, and really, like, where this is going to be valuable is as we're building a new system that goes out to very high NA illumination with a very large field of view, we're building up um, larger resolution improvement factors, so like the ratio of the original NA to the final NA that you capture, um, gets larger and larger as you do this. And that's where you start to really see these like benefits of, of multiplexing because everything's shooting off quadratically because you're in two dimensions here. Okay, here's, uh, of course it works. Um, you see some noise artifacts now because we're fundamentally taking less data, right? There's, so we, we become noise limited at some point and that's actually where we stop. Um, so, but this is captured extremely quickly. These are, uh, what are these? They are rat uh, neural stem cells, I believe. Okay, so that was the gigapixel imaging. Um, I'll talk really quickly about how we can go to 3D because obviously not all samples are 2D and we wanted to get to 3D. So we started out with thinking about, as I change my illumination, I've been assuming that this shift in Fourier space is happening when I change my illumination angle. That's not true if I have a thick sample, right? If I have a thin, I've been assuming a thin sample, but if I have a thick sample, as I change my illumination, I'm actually projecting through different parts of the object. And so tomography says that you're going to get different results with every angle. And you can see this here. So this is two resolution targets. One is rotated on top of the other. They're separated by about 100 microns. And I'm just turning my, moving my illumination around so they appear to shift. And so the faster they walk across the screen, the further they are away from the focal plane. So the focal plane is somewhere in between the two of them, and they're about equidistant apart from it, and they move in opposite directions because they're on opposite sides of the focal plane. So the geometric optics fully predicts this. If I have one LED coming in with this ray, another from that ray, then my image is going to shift by delta x, which is just, just look at these triangles and figure out how, how deep this thing is, right? So the depth information is encoded in how fast this thing is walking across the screen. This is exactly what light fields talk about. I have uh, some XY pictures across different angles. I can take a slice of that. So if I just look along one line of X and plot the intensity versus different angles, you can see here now it's, everything's in focus. So, uh, so you've got this dark line that's going off at all angles equally. It's not walking across the screen at all. That means it's in focus. If I look at this line, now th this part of the object is walking across the screen as I change the angle. And the faster it walks means the more tilted this line means the, the further away it is from focus. This is what light fields is all about. So we can do this sort of 
um, basically untilting these things and projecting across all angles because intensity is the projection across all angles. And we can get this. Uh, so this is a, a synthetically generated focus stack from these set of images taken at different angles. So it's just like a, a motionless way of getting your, your depth stack from a bunch of images taken at different angles. Uh, and I wish this was nice, but it, there's a major problem here. This is what it is. So these are the two resolution targets that are two different depths, and one is rotated with respect to the other. So if I physically focus on them versus digitally refocus them, I'm ma getting major problems, right? So I'm not resolving the small features of this resolution target. And what are the major problems? Well, it looks like ringing effects and stuff. And that is because I just used a ray optics model to, to re-propagate wave optical light, right? So I have diffraction effects completely not included in this because I just, I just corrected all the geometric shifts. I didn't correct for the fact that this thing is also diffracting outwards as it defocuses. So that causes, that's going to cause more and more problems the further you go. Um, so what do we need to correct diffraction effects? We need phase. Um, and so our algorithm is just to write an optimization problem that's going to solve for the phase and amplitude, not just in this one plane, but actually in two different planes in this case. Um, and you can solve this. You may need to take more data, but you can solve this. Um, and once you do, you can get back a map of the, this is a map of the absorption at these two different depth planes. And now when you look at, zoom in on this fine feature, you can resolve it as well as the original NA of the microscope could. So this is using only bright field data. Um, so this can all be written as a neural network now. Once you start talking about these layers, they can be thought of as the layers of a neural network. And each of these nodes is the different pixels in the 2D image as you go through the third dimension. So uh, our nonlinear optimization algorithm is exactly the same thing as an artificial neural network. It's the exact same algorithm once you put it into this framework, except we're only doing the training step. We never do a prediction step after we've done the training. So the final result is the trained three-dimensional object that we're looking for. Of course, we can do more than two planes. Um, so there's a lot of prior work on this sort of multi-slice forward model for treating each, for treating the 3D object as a bunch of 2D slices. It's very obvious how, that you can do this, and your slices should be separated by the depth of field. Um, then you can run this optimization problem and solve for everything. It's completely analogous to neural networks. Um, which we only found out afterwards when somebody published something with the exact same algorithm, but in a totally different framework. But the cool thing is that this fully accounts for multiple scattering. So if, if something scatters off the first layer of the object, then you're accounting for it, and then at the second layer, the third layer, and the fourth layer. So actually, you can account for multiple scattering in this. But the problem is that you don't know if this is solvable. Um, in machine learning, they use these neural networks all the time, but they don't really care if they get the right answer because they just want a better answer than uh, the other guy. Um, but we actually care because there's only one right answer and we don't know if we're getting it. So uh, even in the 2D case, we don't know that we're definitely getting the correct answer. And I think this is a really cool topic of research, but I need some math people to solve this, not me. Um, here's an example of a biological tissue. So this is, this is just so that you can see that we can do this across many planes, not just these two simple layers of the resolution target. This is an algae. Uh, and I want to step back for a minute and think about what I just told you. So I said that if your object is thin, I can take a stack of images from different angles of illumination and solve it for uh, an image that has higher resolution than the diffraction limit of the objective used. But then I told you if your object is thick, I can take a stack of images uh, at different angles of illumination and solve for the 3D object itself, right? This is, this is very much like tomography. In fact, light fields is the same thing as tomography. So what we're doing is, is very much like diffraction tomography. And the obvious question is, can I do both? Can I solve for 3D with the resolution of beyond the diffraction limit of the objective? Um, so you can imagine that I, I'm getting information from that, that higher, higher NA because I'm illuminating from on axis. So now when I have this 3D object with fine resolution, I'm actually uh, shifting the spectrum of every layer, and I have all these different layers that I'm trying to solve for. Luckily, our optimization problem just doesn't care. It can be very black boxy and just try to solve for these. Uh, and if you have enough data, um, you can do this. So here's an experimental example. This is the same two resolution targets, one on top of the other. I'm using a lower NA microscope to do this now. 
Um, so if I do physical focusing, um, these are the two planes in which those two resolution targets are. So now I used a lower NA so you can see some of the out-of-focus blur from the other layer, which our algorithm is supposed to get rid of. Um, but if I zoom in, I'm now not resolving these smaller features of the resolution target. So if I take all of my data and run it through our algorithm, um, we can get back both layers separately. They're, they're nicely separated from each other. And I'm resolving these things beyond what the resolution limit of the objective was. You can also see here that this is not perfect, uh, especially in 3D. Uh, we have a little bit of redundancy, but not very much. And the algorithm is very much not perfect. So we do run into issues of like, this is basically this big square is occluding everything behind it. And we don't have a sufficient range of angles to recover it properly. So this is never perfect. Um, but it, it does work in practice. Um, and if you use finer angle sampling, you can do better. OK, so I talked about a lot of different things you can do with this same simple hardware platform that's cheap and easy. And I think this is a really powerful thing about computational imaging, is that you can be pretty opportunistic about how you do things and try to figure out these kind of uh, simple systems that can do, th do all kinds of things by thinking creatively about how to do, in this case, illumination. But of course, we have a whole other side of our group working on detection. We actually wanted to exploit the fact that it's super simple and easy. So my student, Zach, 3D printed uh, a cell scope microscope, which is just using the camera on your cell phone. And he built this dome of LEDs to do all of this stuff on, on a phone. And it's all programmed in Android. So everything runs on the phone really slowly. You can see it being really slow. <laughs> but we can have the, these viewers and do all of this. And this is all for. Um, uh, some collaborations that we have on taking these portable microscopes out for like disease diagnosis in, in third world countries. This is actually a video. Maybe not. Um, anyway, so the next step that we're going is to exploit time because our LEDs can be modulated much faster than the exposure time of the camera and motion blur is still a problem even though we can capture these things with half a second. So um, there's some nice flutter shutter stuff uh, I should have the reference here. This is an idea out of MIT um, that you can, f you can code your, your illumination. Well, they were coding their aperture in time during the exposure. We're coding our illumination in time and with a, a continuous pattern and then de-blur the result later. So we would like to put this kind of idea into the whole Fourier tachography pipeline and solve like a really large space-time problem that's impossible to compute. Um, so I'll stop there and thanks a lot for your attention. Happy to take any questions. Questions from the audience? Yes, Jose. 